You are now listening to the Key Roger W. Jones Executive Leaders podcast series. This week's episode features Eileen McDaniel and Judge Nancy Griswold. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button for instant updates and access to all of Key's online resources, including this podcast series. I'd like to start, if I could, uh, Nancy, with you, because you wrote this nomination up. Uh, you obviously thought that there was something about Eileen that was special. I'm curious, what is it that, uh, what is it that leadership means to you? What, what, what do you? How do you see leadership today? Oh, wow. Um, so, first of all, I think leadership often gets confused with management and supervision and that sort of thing. And it, it really is a completely different set of skills and something that not everybody seems to have. It, it, you know, for some folks, it just seems to come naturally. And they're, you know, what you call the, the sort of charismatic um, um, leader. But it, it has to do with setting a vision. It has to do with motivating uh, employees or motivating staff and the people you work with uh, to kind of follow along with you toward a common goal. Um, and, and that's something that I think when I looked at Eileen and have been privileged to work with her for many, many, many years, she really does exemplify all of those things. Uh, people want to work for Eileen. They want to excel. They want to make her proud. And uh, it's not just the people that work for her or report to her. It's, you know, it has been across the organization. They want her her good opinion. And um, I, I think that that exemplifies leadership to, to make people want to follow along with you and to set a vision and some goals that uh, people can get behind. Well, that's terrific. And you know, good leaders beget good leaders, or I should maybe say it differently. Great leaders beget great leaders. So if think about your time as a leader. Can you tell me maybe one of the proudest moments you've had in your leadership career? Well, it, you know, in truth, it may be similar to, to Eileen's. I mean, we worked together toward a common goal. And uh, it was, I think my proudest moment was when we actually got the funding to expand uh, OMHA, the Office of Medicare Hearings and Appeals, and to double the size of the organization. And we had been working toward that goal for, oh gosh, six or seven years. I mean, we put our first budget requests in and it, you know, it involved developing a narrative and um, explaining what we do and why we were a good investment for government at all levels. You know, so you start with the department and then OMB and then ultimately um, the appropriations committees. So when, I think when they recognized that and, and gave us that money, that really probably was my proudest moment in an entire government career. That's terrific. And, and what, a, what an amazing accomplishment. Eileen, what about you? I mean, so uh, congratulations again. And I'm going to say this now before I forget. The, 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 the selection committee, for there's, there's two different levels of selection for this award. Um, there's a first cut that's made by our advisory board and our alums. And then the second, the vote, actually comes from our Roger Jones committee, who have some pretty interesting, fascinating people. Terry Gurton, the president of Napa. She's been with Napa for years. Um, Mortimer Downey, uh, just some really, really wonderful, lovely people who take this so seriously. And, and this year and every single year, it seems that the races get tighter and there's more and more good people out there, which is a great problem to have. But, but it, it's, it's just so amazing. And, and we're so pleased for you that you've been able to, uh, to win this year. And, and so I'm curious for you. So what does leadership look like to you today? Well, I think leadership, as Nancy said, I think it has evolved. Of course, you have to set a strategic vision so that your employees and those that work for you at the staff level and at the management level know what the expectations are and know what the goals of the organization are. And, you know, Nancy mentioned the fact that we had tried for multiple years to get funding because we were growing an enormous backlog in Medicare appeals. And the, the challenge to be able to double the size of the agency, not only with staffing, but doubling the size of offices and then ensuring that Medicare beneficiaries and, and appellants have their cases um, here heard and decided um, timely. And we've had a lot of success in reducing the backlog since we got the funding for additional resources and staffing. 
but I'd be remiss if I didn't go back a little bit in time. We've just, as you all know, celebrated the, the 19th anniversary of the events of 9-11. Um, and I was actually hosting a national conference, National Child Support Enforcement Conference, right at Crystal City on that fateful day. Um, and having to lead individuals who were in from all over the country through that trauma, the trauma of you know, getting them home and the trauma of helping them make connections with families. We never know when we're gonna be called to lead or the nature of our leadership. So I think it's, it's important for us to always be ready and well prepared for any scenario that may come our way. Was that your proudest moment, Eileen? That was my proudest moment because nice. I think that it was a, a servant leader type of moment. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, that servant perspective is what we see with so many. I mean, we use the word public service so often. I think we forget the importance of that word service. And I think public service, uh, many times those that work in the public service get so, they're so passionate about what they do. Um, sometimes when you take you take a step back and say, you know what, but let me tell you how great you are because you deliver, we use a phrase in, in our program all the time of called, we say delivering democracy or delivering civilization to us every day. And you do, I mean, it's just amazing. Was, is there anything about your public service career that, that you wish you would have known when you started? I think as you start, especially as you move into management, um, you need to learn that you have to hear all perspectives and get all a lot of feedback from individuals um, and bring everyone to the table. I think when you make that transition, you're so used to working a problem by yourself um, that you don't realize that, um, that you need a broader cohort of individuals to, to make you stronger and to attack a problem. So I think that's one of the biggest transitions into leadership and management is getting all viewpoints and ensuring that individuals who work for you and work with you know that you, that they will be heard and that they can give opposing views and i think it's important for managers to hear opposing views to hear all sides oftentimes that may not happen um and i think it's critical to the success of an individual and the success of the organization to ensure you know it, and happening. sometimes sometimes we see with our senior leaders that we work with in the key program they come in they're very experienced they have a lot of technical skill uh, a lot of success they, they actually can't see the, the options. They can't see the other viewpoints because they're so you know, laser focused on what they've done so well for so long. We have to kind of help them understand all these other perspectives. So Nancy, how about you? Is there anything you wish you would have known back in the day when you started your public service journey? So uh, I guess I'll go a, a slightly different track, which is, is the idea that you kind of have to nudge people along. I use the analogy of leadership is kind of horseback riding as well. And when, when you horseback ride, you can't muscle the horse in one direction or another. People just generally are not strong enough to do that, women in particular. Uh, so from a women's leadership perspective, you, you just kind of have to nudge and keep nudging along. Uh, I think when I started my, my work in management and in leadership, I tried to bludgeon my way into making people do certain things. And that may work in the short term to mandate various things, but it is much better if you can build the coalitions, kind of nudge people and make more gradual sorts of changes that people actually buy into, they make them their own. And I think that kind of goes to what Eileen was saying. One of the things that I have learned from Eileen over many years is who you need to talk to and who you need to get in the boat with you from a leadership perspective, especially if you're going to be making major changes. Uh, you don't want to just do that in a vacuum. She would always come to me before I would make these major uh, decisions and say, you really need to go talk to this one at the department or you need to talk to that one or why don't you just give them a heads up? And often that would lead to other options. And if not other options for moving forward, then certainly more ease in getting where I needed to go. You know, you made, you made the comment about kind of the unique 
uh, challenges that women face in, in leadership and developing and, and growing and, and succeeding. And uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, hey, Jennifer, maybe we ought to ask Nancy if she wants to be part of the Women's Leadership Forum next year. Just putting it out there. We're just, you know, I mean, you know, it's a great event. We've done this for years and had just, just a great time with it. But that's a different subject. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but, you but, know, she would be she would be excellent because not only has she been a leadership uh, a leader in an administrative law judge um, environment. Um, she has recently joined the SAS Corps at the Department of Labor. So I think she brings some very unique perspectives. A woman who is a judge um, and a woman who has transitioned um, into judicial leadership as well as um, SAS leadership. Absolutely, no doubt about it. To tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know I know it is a Friday afternoon. We don't want to keep you all for too long, but I did I did have one more question that I'd like to ask both of you. And Eileen, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, young leaders that come through our programs, uh, and, and and we have graduate students that come through our programs as well that are looking uh, to, to stay in the public service and advance in the public service. What does the future of public service? leadership look like to you, Eileen? What do you think that, that, that tomorrow's leader is going to need in a big way? I think tomorrow, the, the, the future of leadership, particularly dealing with the new generation of leaders, is to be aware that, you know, millennials who are coming into the workplace, um, they want opportunities, they want different opportunities, they want diversity in their, in their workload, and I think it's important to make opportunities available for, for staff and for managers. I think my, my proudest moment, the, the work that I enjoy most as a public servant is the mentoring that I have done for young leaders across the board, um, both my work at the Social Security Administration and at the Office of Medicare Hearings and Appeals. I have established um, and served in career development roles for employees. Um, and my bis biggest accomplishment is watching those employees move into management positions, become members of the SES. Um, I have attorneys who have worked for me that have become administrative law judges, employees who have gone to work um, on, the Cap on Capitol Hill for appropriation committees. So I think you need flexibility. I think the work-life balance is critical. The, it's, uh, leadership in federal service is very different than it was three decades ago where people came into public service and they wanted to stay in public service and retire from public service. And you just don't see that any longer. You see a group of individuals who like to come in and out of public service, like to work in the public sector, like to take a, like to take a break from working and then come back in. So I think management has to be aware and make those opportunities available and know that going in um, into their programs and how they staff their programs. Absolutely. Uh, Nancy, what about you? What, from your vantage point, you've got, you've got a, the magic eight ball in front of you. What are you going to tell us about the future of public service leadership? I think that as I have watched, and I've been in leadership uh, roles for probably about, I don't know, 18 years, never have I seen a greater need for real leaders, not just managers, not just programmer policy people but real leaders in government. I, I think Eileen is exactly right. I, I think people, the tendency is now for people to come into government, to work in government for a while, and then to leave. And so we need to, we really need to work on retention and finding ways of keeping people in public service. You know, I've heard that Millennials do not uh, necessarily like the idea of public service. They think of their work as having an impact and they're looking for, um, for ways to have an impact on the world in a broader sense. And uh, we need to find some way of messaging this or, or, or explaining the necessity of public service to really a new generation that views their careers in a different way. You know, I did a presentation a couple of years ago for the Chico Council, and mm -hmm. um, I haven't been invited back. And I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, because they asked me to come speak about these millennials that are driving them crazy. And they were like, Patrick, give us the clue. How do we lead these crazy, lazy millennials? And, and what I said to them was, was very much along the lines of, of what both of you said. I said, you know what? They want to make a difference. And they, but, but here's yeah. the thing. They want to know they're making a difference. We as mm -hmm. leaders have to make that connection for them. We can't expect them to do it themselves. They don't know. Mm 
So we have to say, you know, how you, what you do here contributes to this goal, you know, public health, you know, the, the health of our nation, uh, world peace, whatever it happens to be, but we have to help them understand. So it's not too much to ask. So I look back at the Chico's and I said, so it's on you. I said, it's on you guys. I mean, listen, we can complain about that younger generation all we want, but it's up to us as the leaders to bridge that gap for them. We're the ones that know. And I know it's hard to do because we're so busy. It's very difficult to make the time to do it. But once, once you get that message, and I, love, and I love the phrase that you use, Nancy, to message it properly. Once you get that message out there, it, it's huge. So with that, listen, I want to thank you both so much for, for your time today. We love focusing on our winners. And of course, uh, all due praise to our winners, but they couldn't do it without the people who take the time to recognize them. We just can't thank you enough for your time and congratulations. Oh, thank you.